welcome to the third pre-modern Korea lecture series of this academic year. My name is Jisoo Kim. I'm the director of the GW Institute for Korean Studies, and I'm also the Korea Foundation Associate Professor of History, International Affairs, and East Asian Languages and Literatures. Thanks to our audience for joining today's pre-modern Korea lecture series. I noticed that we have audiences joining from various parts of the world. I appreciate your interest in Professor King's talk today. Uh, I'm so delighted to have Professor Ross King with us at this lecture series. His research area covers a broad range of topics and has trained numerous PhD students in the field of Korean language and literature. He's one of the leading scholars in the field and has significantly contributed to Korean studies through his research and service. Um, now, let me first have the pleasure of introducing him. Uh, Ross King is professor of Korean at the University of British Columbia. He, his research focuses on the cultural and social history of language, writing, and literary culture in Korea and in the Sinographic Cosmopolis more broadly, with a particular interest in comparative histories of vernacularization. He serves as editor-in-chief of the Sungin Journal of East Asian Studies, as managing editor of the Brill Korean Studies Library, and as co-editor of the Brill series, Language, Writing, and Literary Culture in the Sinographic Cosmopolis police. He has two forthcoming books, uh, one an edited volume titled Cosmopolitan and Vernacular in the World of One, reading Sheldon Pollock from the Sinographic Cosmopolis from Braille, and, uh, the, and the book titled his monograph, um, I Thank Korea for Her Books, James Gardgale, Korean Literature in Hanmun, and Alan Metropolitan Missionary Orientalism from the University of Toronto Press. Very impressive. <laughs> the title of his talk today is Did, Did Chusa Kim Jong Hee Really Translate Xi Xianji into Korean Literary Fame, Manuscript Culture, and the Story of the Western Wing in Chosun, Korea? Um, now, before I ask Ross King uh, to give his talk, I would like to mention to our audience to submit your questions using the question box, not chat box. Uh, please feel free to submit them anytime during the talk. I will try to address as many questions as I can during the Q&A session. So now, without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Ross. It's all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Chisu, <clears throat> and um, thank you all for coming. It's nice to see a lot of familiar names uh, in the participants list. Um, and I want to uh, start by also giving a shout out to Chisu just for organizing this series and for the great work she's doing on the pre-modern Korean studies front. Uh, this is a really exciting uh, series and I hope I can uh, live up to some of the other uh, talks. And what I'm going to present today um, is something that I first presented maybe three years ago at the um, annual MLA conference in a very Kind of truncated format, you know, where they typically have just 20 minutes to do it. And when I prepare these things, I'm I'm really not very good at timing them for 20 minutes. I don't know how long it'll actually take me to to, to get through it today, but I'm hoping it'll be around 45, 50 minutes. Um, and I had also hoped that um, by scheduling this talk today, it would force me to go back and do a deeper dive into some of this because it's really a, a sort of stalled project and a work in progress. Um, but alas, uh, teaching responsibilities this term have completely thwarted my uh, plans to do much new on this, uh, but it has been uh, good to go back and look at this again and think about it a bit more. So I, I'm actually really hoping that some of your questions and comments will spur me to um, you know, put this back on, on a front burner. So uh, let me um, share screen and fire up my slides. So, okay, here we go. So, so the title uh, you've all seen, uh, it, it's you know, admittedly uh, on the face of it, a kind of narrow question. Did, did Chusa Kim Jong-hee really translate Chi Shang-ji into uh, Korean? And the, the, the panel that this was originally kind of uh, prompted by was a panel specifically on literary fame um, in Korea. So some of the themes that um, are gonna come up uh, in the course of uh, the talk are as follows, and more generally, just how, what was the reception history of this really famous Chinese play uh, in uh, Chosun, Korea and after Chosun. Um, and then uh, sp more specifically, uh, this claim that um, Yi Ga Wan made in 1974, which pertains to um, this very famous, uh, essentially genius, uh, Kim Jong-hee, 
um, who has, um, as we shall see, attracted a lot of attention um, in recent years, um, and his claim that uh, Kim Jong He trans created a, a vernacular translation of the Xixiangji um, among the various translations that we have. And so this then, uh, I think, uh, leads to a, an interesting discussion about the image, the reputation, and also the timing of the image and reputation um, of Kim Jong Hee um, coming out of uh, late Chosun and into the 20th century. It also, I think, um, forces a, us to reevaluate um, the timing of the so-called Xixiangji boom, which I'll talk about again in a minute. And then finally, I want to um, end with just some, I guess, musings about the way we think about traditional manuscript culture um, in Korea and the traditional assumption that as soon as you hit the 20th century, it kind of all withers away and is swept aside by modern ways of, of, of reading and modern forms of, of kind of book culture. So in terms of the reception of this play in Chosun, there's actually not, uh, considering how very popular this play was amongst Chosun readers, there's not a whole lot of research. It kind of falls between two stools so that the, um, the people doing Chinese language and literature uh, in Korea um, don't bother with the reception in Korea so much because they think that's not their problem. They study China. Whereas our colleagues in the sort of Kugo Kumunhakwa say, well, this is not our problem because it's Uri Bashi right? It's, it's, not a, it's not a Korean work. And yet uh, Koreans read it quite avidly. So um, considering all of that, um, research on it has started rather late um, and there's just only a handful of people doing it. So Kim Hyo Min, um, that uh, 2010 there, he actually, that's one of a number of really excellent papers that he has written. He's at um, Korea University. And um, the other really significant researcher is the last one, Yun Ji Yang, who wrote her dissertation at Seoul National in 2015. Um, and that's a very thorough study. The rest are just sort of occasional papers here and there that don't really um, do a deep dive or go do the legwork you need to do to look at the, the various manuscripts. Um, we know that um, sometime between 1506 and 1549 that the play had arrived in Chosun. I think there's a record of uh, Yun San Gun, you know, requesting it along with a number of other kind of vernacular Chinese uh, works um, at the turn of the 16th century. And certainly by 1549, um, because it's also cited in the notes to the um, to the Chan Deng Xinhua Kuhe, the, the uh, sort of annotations to the Jian Deng Xinhua. So certainly it's circulating uh, already in the 16th century. Um, today, there are at least 80 different manuscript copies uh, in various collections in Korea, which if you think about it is an awful lot, but that bespeaks a very wide distribution and sort of popularity. Um, and crucially, they are all manuscript. I'm not, I'm not talking about print copies that came in from China. Uh, the book itself was never printed in Chosun, unlike, for example, the Samgukji. Um, because it was considered a lewd work. It, it was um, sort of, I guess, considered, you could almost say it like soft porn. Uh, it was not something that a respectable gentleman would, would read and not something that you could have ever gotten away with printing uh, in Chosa. And yet, of course, still very popular. <clears throat> but, and furthermore, all of the copies that we do have that survive in, uh, from Chosun, there, there were other versions, but there must have been around, but the, but the, the Jin Shantang version, uh, kind of swept the field and now everything is based on his version uh, of the play. Everything that we have from Chosa. So in terms of um, the actual kind of uh, popularity of the work, uh, Yi Chang Su uh, describes uh, what he calls a sasang yol, a kind of mania for, for the Shishangji. Uh, Kim Hyo Min has talked about a uh, sasangi tok so yol, a kind of reading craze for um, the play. And then Yun Ji Yang has talked about a Sosangi Eho, which is supposed to be a kind of uh, Xixiangji fandom. Um, and, and this uh, you can also see in the actual execution of the manuscripts. They were quite lovingly reproduced, oftentimes with uh, hand-drawn um, illustrations in color of, of um, the protagonist of, 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 of Oriole. Uh, so the, the readers took, and anyway, very carefully executed um, and clearly with great love and care when they read and copied uh, this play. And just a really quick anecdote as to sort of 
I guess, um, an indication of the status of this work. Uh, here's Nam Gong Tol um, saying, I, I was in the Amun office all day dealing with paperwork when I saw one of my esteemed colleagues whiling away the time under the China pinks with a copy of Xi Shangji in hand, and he looked just like one of the Taoist immortals to me, but the, here this idea being that the Xi Shangji had this image as being written in a really bizarre and marvelous um, form of synetic, you know, his vernacular says so basically so-called bai hua, um, and, but also just um, something that was almost otherworldly and um, just really marvelous. And uh, but again, not something you would do uh, at work uh, or as a, you know, uh, on official time. So um, in terms of the translations of it that we have that are extant, uh, they, they come in various types. Uh, so first of all, does it include the fifth act or not? Jin Shang Tan uh, cut the fifth act from his version um, and yet uh, we do have uh, some manuscripts that retain the fifth uh, version, although it's usually quite perfunctory. They don't have the same love and care or same commentary that the, uh, that the first four acts do. So that's the Sokpyeon versus non Sokpyeon, the check mark versus the X. And then we have uh, complete translations. We have uh, partial translations that, uh, that, or else that are just the, the Han Moon with uh, Hyunto uh, um, attached to them, the sort of glossed versions, and then even retranslations. And for the, the things in red on the right hand column, each kind of translation, whether it's whole or you know, partial or you know, glossed or not, et cetera, uh, eventually um, appears in print in the early 20th century during the, um, the first. Two or three, two and three de decades of the 20th century. Those are the ones in red uh, that were published, that were actually printed after Chosan. In terms of uh, these printed editions of the Xi Xiangji that I've just alluded to, one thing that I, I uh, like to point out is that typically when you read about the history of the printing of fiction uh, in um, 20th century Korea, the usual starting date is to cite uh, Yihe Zhou's version of the Chunhyang story, this Ok Jung Hwa, um, which was printed in 1912. And this is sort of usually given as the inaugural date when we have printed fiction uh, in, uh, in Korea. Uh, and uh, an another point to make is that the, the Xi Shangji, although it's a play, was read as fiction in Korea. It was never performed. So it was read like any other work of fiction. Um, but um, if you look at all these uh, works, these are all different printed versions of the play, starting with 1906. So, you know, six years before Yi Hei Zhou's thing, there was a printed um, uh, a version, you know, in Korean of the So San Gi, that first one by um, Chung Gu Sup. Um, so, you know, but of course, typically left out because after all, it's Chinese, it's not Korean, right? Um, but that gives you an idea. And this is not a complete list. Uh, I, I believe you can find uh, printed editions. You know, some of these are in their third or fourth edition, if you look. Um, uh, and I think it goes into the early 1930s. This is just sort of a, a snapshot from an article. So very popular right into the 20s and 30s uh, in, in, um, in Korea. So let's go back now to Kim Jong-hee, who's kind of the other uh, protagonist here. Uh, those are his dates up top, um, sort of died 1856, uh, had a couple different um, monikers, either Wandang or Chusa, typically referred to as Chusa these days. It's a famous portrait of him. Another portrait here in the Amore Pacific Museum, this particular portrait graces the frontispiece of um, Iga Wan's book that I'm going to talk about. And um, it's not, it's kind of small on the slide, but on the right hand side of that image uh, where it says Wan Dang Sun Sang, uh, that, um, you know, I, I believe is a kind of gesture towards uh, uh, Kim Jong Hee's very distinctive uh, calligraphic style, or at least one of his distinctive calligraphic styles where they kind of try to reproduce the way he uh, did his calligraphy. So what about Kim Jong-hee or what about him is, is so interesting? Well, within the last, say, decade or so, there's been a real kind of surge of interest in him. And it tends to be associated with, or he tends to be associated with what is depicted as a kind of cosmopolitan moment in late Chosun. So this uh, Japanese scholar, Takahashi Hiromi, 
uh, writes about a Higashi uh, Aja no Bungei Kyowakoku, a republic of letters in East Asia, where Kim Jong Hee is kind of the at the at, is the center or the nexus uh, because he was reading stuff from Japan. He was you know um, going to Beijing and and hobnobbing and and, and corresponding with uh, leading um, Qing intellectuals and so on. Um, that same sentiment is uh, re repeated verbatim in Chung Min's book five years later, um, based on some of the work he was doing at Harvard Yenching, again, where he uses the phrase Munye Kunghagu, a Republic of Letters. Um, and there he's talking about uh, this professor, Fujisuka, who was professor at Keijo Imperial University and who um, also um, essentially led the charge in terms of um, excavating and, and and putting on a pedestal, really, um, Kim Jong-hee. Pak Toh Sang is a very interesting, he's a banker. He works for some big bank down in Chollado, but he's also a very um, um, uh, erudite scholar of Korean epigraphy. He's a bibliophile. He himself is a book collector, owns a lot of really rare editions. He wrote this book on, on Kim Jong-hee, kind of highlighting his Kum um, or his epigraphy. Uh, which is something that he was always known for, um, but is kind of the expert on Kim Jong-hee these days um, in South uh, Korea. And then this other scholar, a Korean who is writing in Japanese out of Japan, um, has studied uh, Keijo Imperial University and this same professor, uh, Fujitsuka, who we'll talk about a little bit uh, later. So there has been this kind of spate of research and even even no less a, a colleague than Benjamin Elman at Princeton uh, recently published uh, an article or a chapter, I should say, on Kim Jong-hee. And the title says it right there, you know, a late Chosun Korean polymath in the cosmopolitan world of Qing China. So again, this kind of appeal to um, a cosmopolitan moment in late Chosun and in, in, in East Asia more, more generally. And then um, three years ago, four years ago now, this article, which we published in the Sangyun Journal um, about uh, Chu Sa Kim Jong Hee, so he's a hot topic. Um, so now, so that so Kim Jong Hee is kind of one player in the story, and then the next player here is um, this Professor Yi Ga Wan, um, who passed away in 2000, a very distinguished um, scholar, uh, 14th uh, generation descendant of Twege. There's a journal now uh, named after him, uh, published by his sort of scholars in his academic line um, from Yonsei, where he was a professor from 1959 to 1982. But um, sometimes I think he's, he's described as the last Chosun Sunbi. He, uh, he, he sort of basically was entirely classically trained until he was in his 20s. Um, and uh, sort of a real, and had a fabulous collection of books, which he had hoped to leave to Yonsei, but Yonsei refused to build a building for them. So he gave them to Tangukde and they're still there today. Um, so the, the, the problem is this book of his in 1974, which was kind of, um, there was a trailer for the book, a teaser published in Munak Sasang in October the year before, where he gives a kind of heje, a kind of you know, bibliographic description and an introduction to a particular manuscript in his possession, which he claimed was translated by, um, Chusa Kim Jong-hee. And he gives even a few photos uh, in this uh, journal um, article. And then the next year, he publishes this Igawan Yakju Sasangi, his um, annotated translation, uh, which has the subtitle Wandang Yokbon, the sort of the annotated translation by Kim Jong-hee, uh, um, along with a parallel um, Hanmun original text. And this is where he makes the claim again, that the vernacular translation, the so-called onhe, um, was executed by none other than Chusa Kim Jong-hee. So the question is, what is the evidence for that, or what are his reasons? So um, in his introduction to the book, he says uh, something like this. He says, right? So reading all of these, uh, these, these minor pieces, uh, by Wanda, I sort of had the suspicion, uh, yeah, he's known as a kumsak uh, uh, guy, but munchega ittagum sangtangwa yusahan kesoga innan kajamida. But there are these, these instances where his style is similar to Jin Shangtan. 
would, you know, so what? I mean, everybody was reading Jin Chunkan and everybody was reading the play and uh, everybody, as we know, was getting in trouble in Chosun for, for copying sort of Sokum styles and more newfangled, you know, vernacular infected uh, styles. But anyway, he says, oh, so therefore, you know, that's that sort of was a tip. Uh, but then he says, uh, this is, I think, uh, really what he, he he's getting at. He says, when you look back at um, the history of translation in Korea, we have no cases of what, you know, where an actual translator is, you know, name uh, uh, um, on things. And so, and we have nothing that, you know, would, could be attributed to someone as, you know, to a scholar like like Wanda. So it's almost like there's this lack, there's this this kind of sense of a deficiency. You know, why is it that, that none of our great scholars, you know, translated anything? Surely they must have, but they just, you know, we just haven't found it yet kind of thing. So I think there's a bit of a, a need here that uh, a perceived need to fill. But then he actually goes into the, the it turns out that this manuscript that was in his possession actually had um, its own preface. And so it gave a date, Pegyang uh, Meng Chun, and at the very end it says Kerim Huin Kim Jong Hee Chi. So it's got a Chi that identifies Kim Jong Hee as having written this preface. And then it even has a seal. It has Wandang, uh, a Wandang seal on it. So he, he concludes, he says that this must have been written are translated, the, the, the unhe must have been completed by uh, Wandang uh, Kim uh, Jong-hee uh, in 1811, which was when he was 26 years old and not long after he had returned from an embassy to Beijing. So uh, this is what that, um, uh, this is an image from that um, preface to the uh, manuscript uh, uh, that was in his possession, the sort of first bit there. It's quite an interesting uh, preface. Um, and then uh, again, from that journal article at the very end, uh, highlighted there in the bottom left is that uh, Chiyo by uh, claiming that uh, Kim Jong Hee is the translator. So you know, these were in the article, not in the book. And this is the first page of the actual manuscript. Again, uh, the image is from the article in 1973. It's not reproduced in the book. But if you look at the very first line, it says, Hua Sol, right? Tang Nara Tuk Jong Huang Jie. Blah, blah, blah. And so it start, it, it's kind of already, you can tell it's, it's heavily so solidified. You know, it, it's been sort of, uh, you know, if it starts out as Hwaso, that's already sort of a, a fictional kind of device. And so it's it's a very much uh, kind of fictionalized or so solidified um, translation of the play. So the book uh, itself uh, is kind of straightforward. Uh, it's each page, you know, facing pages are set up like this where the right-hand page is his modern Korean translation. And on the left, you get a transcription of the um, actual manuscript itself and with the old orthography. And then uh, the, the Hanmun from one of the Republican era printed uh, versions of the play. So that's kind of um, his claims. And so there are a number of problems with uh, this claim. So the first problem is that the actual manuscript that was in his possession is not, uh, everybody agrees that's not in Chusa's handwriting. Um, the second is that the seal uh, must have been added later. Uh, and again, I, you know, experts would agree that, you know, agree in print, oh yeah, you know, the seal probably was added later. Um, and furthermore, the, the actual manuscript that all this is based on has now gone missing. No one knows where it is. No one can find it. And so no one can go back and sort of take a look at it. So that's sort of the first set. Of problems. But then um, the problem uh, in my mind that's really worse is that this particular claim by him has been accepted as gospel by any number of quite prominent uh, South Korean scholars. Um, some that are in his uh, academic lineage and some that are not. Um, however, um, it is, uh, so right up to, to, to 2017, and I'm, I'm sure I could find more, you see this repeated. In fact, uh, the Yu Chun Dong, that last one there, he's very much in, the, he, you know, he's currently a professor at Yonsei, and he's in that line. And that's in a volume edited by Hug Young Jin, who is the Han Moon professor, now emeritus at Yonsei, who's also in dir a direct line of academic, you know, descent from, uh, from Iga Wan. 
um, this is a volume that they put together sort of lionizing their unsanim and sort of saying, oh, it's, it's just so terrible. What a shame that this amazing work by Iga One of 1974 doesn't get the ten attention it deserves, even though while writing this, they're pretty much oblivious to other work that has taken place since um, Iga One made his original claim. So it's completely uncritically accepted. In the meantime, there have been uh, dissenting voices already back in 2003, Kim Young Jin, who is a very distinguished Hanmun uh, Kyosu at uh, Sungyun Gwan University, and also knows his way around old books. I mean, he's a real, you know, Sojihak expert. He had already in 2003 identified two more manuscripts that have the very same preface, but without the, that last little line about, um, you know, the, the Chia attributing it to Chusa. So that already kind of opens up a can of worms, the fact that, okay, there's this preface, you know, clearly a, a, a preface written by a, a Chosun reader, um, and someone seems to have just decided to add Chusa's name at the very end to, to it. And in, in Kim Young Jin's view, so first of all, Kim Young Jin kind of pours a heap scorn on this idea that someone like Kim Jong Hee uh, would essentially dirty his, his, sully his reputation by attaching his name to something as salacious as the uh, as the Shishanji um, because of his you know prominence and his political kind of uh, clout and power um, and so on this is not something he would do so he says actually for my money I think uh, if anybody a good candidate to have written this preface and perhaps uh, to even to have done the um, translation is in fact EO although it's impossible to prove um, and then Kim Hyo Min, who I've mentioned earlier, um, in his, you know, again, very well researched and very uh, uh, thorough um, examinations, he um, says, first of all, this Iga Wan uh, edition, he says, it's just a basic, it's an additional kind of yun sacrificing and socialification of a pre existing translation. It's, it, it's sort of a, a cumulative or a, a creative kind of production, is not the product of one. Uh, Literatus's independent and original work, or even of an accomplished uh, writer. And he identifies four uh, uh, manuscripts that have the same preface, but again, minus the attribution to Kim Jung Hee. Um, and he actually thinks that this copy owned by Yang Sun Min, another professor um, of sort of Kojan Muna, um, is actually closest uh, to the source translation, uh, of which, and you know, there are many other translations based on it. So he's, he's kind of gone into all of the, the, the translation history more than, than anybody else almost. Well, um, then most recently after that, Yun Jiang, who wrote her PhD thesis at Seoul National in the Chinese department, by the way, and, and apparently she tells me ran into all kinds of kind of roadblocks and sort of foot dragging on the part of her um, sort of uh, professors about why are you doing this? This is not, you know, this is this is not Chinese studies. This is Korea, you know, you know. Anyway, didn't get a lot of kind of um, heartfelt support for this dissertation, which is a brilliant dissertation. Uh, she says, look, this 1811 version was already a, a kind of retranslation or a, or, a, or, a, or a kind of tweaked uh, version of an, uh, something earlier. She thinks that Kim Young Ji's idea of Eok maybe being the translator is pretty persuasive. And then she actually lists the four manuscripts that have the same preface. And there they are. The Su Gyeong Shil is actually Pak Cho Sang, who I mentioned before, that his, his, his books are all Su Gyeong Shil, Su Jang. And then Kung Min De, Tang Guk De, Kyu Jang Gak. So there are a number of them around that have that same preface. Well, um, so at this point, I want to kind of complicate things even further. Um, and introduce uh, a, a brand new uh, a manuscript that has not yet been um, made known to the academic community. This is the sort of um, the, the cover of the first volume. So it's the Hua Wa Kum Mong Gi, uh, which is, you know, the, the, the play oftentimes went under different titles on the cover of these manuscripts. On the inside, you can see here, uh, um, it says, uh, you know, Su Shi San Seng, uh, and then there's the the Hawa Kumungi, and then on the left, Wandang Kosa He, uh, and and uh, so that's kind of the inside cover. This is what it looks like. There's no date on it. It's impossible to put a date to it, uh, but to my mind, it looks actually like it's probably colonial period. Uh, the paper and so on. Uh, this is a fairly common, I think, uh, kind of template that was used to create manuscripts. Uh, so that's the first page there is uh, Jin Chang Tan's first preface. 
this is the kind of um, very first uh, scene from the play. And then what's typical about many of these manuscripts is uh, you can, it's not a great slide, I'm sorry, but on the top margin, you can see there are these um, lexical glosses where these difficult terms from Bai Hua, which was very difficult for Chosun literati to read because they were only trained in straight up you know, classical. Um, it gives these lexical glosses, sometimes in Hanmun, sometimes in vernacular um, for difficult terms in the, uh, uh, the Bai Hua. And then you can see scattered throughout is our vernacular translations of the arias, just the arias. So that's this An Sung Jun copy. Um, and the thing about this An Sung Jun copy, which says right on the cover, you know, advertises itself as a Wandang uh, translation by you know, Kim Jong-hee, it's totally different from the Iga Wan copy, right? So, it, it, and this An Sung Jun copy, unlike the Iga Wan uh, copy is only a partial translation. It's what they call a Kong Mun Panyapon. So the Kong Mun are, the, are the, the, the texts to the actual arias that were sung in the play. Um, and that was uh, kind of the first step towards a, a full translation was to do the arias. And it was these arias that were sort of appreciated for their artistry and for their language and which got both uh, um, sort of glossed and commentated and translated first uh, in the history of the reception of the play. And then there's a good article about these particular um, aria only translations by uh, Yu, uh, Sun Hyun and Min Guangdong. Um, where they talk about how the first of all that we don't have any extant really early annotated editions of, of Xi Shangji in uh, from Chosun. They're mostly all quite late. Um, although again, dating is always a problem, uh, or you, it's almost always a problem. Um, um, but it, uh, they reckon that these aria only translations would have been closest to sort of the first attempts at kind of domesticating the text. And they also point out that many of these um, aria only translations typically have um, chuhe in the title, sort of annotated. Uh, the chu is the annotation, and the he is the puri, right? The sort of the, essentially the, the unheification of the text. And um, furthermore, they note that uh, the annotations in these um, aria only translations are often uh, consistent with or copied out of this. Um, Chosun commentary called the Yam Mong Man Sok, which was a full commentary on the play written by some mysterious and unknown um, Chosun commentator. We have about a, a dozen, maybe 13 copies extant. So let's go back to the, to the, to the cover again. So first is, you know, look at the, the, the hand. Again, this looks to be sort of an attempt to mimic the kind of chusa che, the chusa calligraphic style in terms of the execution of the, the, the frontispiece uh, to the manuscript. Um, it says one dan kosa he, so it's got that he character of chu he for the puri. Uh, again, I think it's an attempt to imitate his calligraphy. And then what about this sushil sanseng cho, which claims that it's written by uh, someone called sushil. Um, well, this is actually the author of the putative author of this mysterious Chosun commentary on the play. And here is a, this is the sort of uh, first page of the Harvard Yenching uh, copy of this, um, this commentary. And you can see right there in red, it says Sushi Sanseng Chu Sap. Um, we don't know who this Sushi Sanseng is. Um, uh, Kim Hyo Min has, has written about this, but we, it's a mystery as to who it might be. Um, so, you know, long story short, uh, Iwa, Iga Wan's manuscript that he, uh, you know, sort of uncritically attributes to Kim Jong-hee and this new copy owned by An Sung Jun that I showed you for, they can't both be Kim Jong-hee. So basically, um, you know, neither of them is connected to Kim Jong-hee um, is, is what we have to conclude. Um, and as a kind of, I, I was, I guess I, won't have a lot of time to go through this, but the An Zung Jun copy that I, I showed to you is virtually identical with another Aria's only uh, edition held in the National Library, which is this. And to give you an idea, I mean, uh, you can see that the, uh, the pages look almost the same, the same. even the, the sort of uh, template, the, the, the paper, um, the lined paper that it's on uh, is identical. Um, and then if you line up two sections here of one of the arias, the only difference is that the Ansung Jun version on the left 
has a little bit of rubrication where it, it blocks off the names of the tunes and the songs and who's singing. Uh, and the one on the right doesn't. But otherwise, you know, there's minor differences in the orthography, but te don so e, right? It, it's, it's literally uh, uh, almost exactly the same text. And there's even another very similar edition down in Andong de Hakyo, uh, where it, it's actually called the, 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 the Hawa Kumbongi. Um, I'll skip through these, but again, very the notes in the margin are exactly the same notes taken out of that uh, Yam Mong Man Sak. And if you line up the three of them again, um, the, the far right is Andong, where instead of breaking up the aria into little bite-sized chunks, they give the whole, you know, uh, line and then give the, the entire um, uh, vernacular translation right after it instead of breaking it up. But it's otherwise largely uh, the same. Uh, and I'm still trying to sort of sort through all this and get it all into a database. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a, uh, a big project. But so I, I wanted to just point that out. So the, the, so the question is, why put Kim Jong-hee's name on a vernacular translation of the Xixiangji? Um, so uh, there are basically two possible answers to this. Uh, and so the first one is, well, it was the cynical, it's basically the cynical use of his newfound notoriety in the 1920s and 30s. So in other words, this must, uh, the one option says this is actually a really late uh, manuscript that was produced at a time when Kim Jong-hee, uh, attaching Kim Jong-hee's name to something like this would raise the price in the antiquities market or the collector's market. Um, and the option two would be, oh, well, maybe this has something to do with uh, Chungin-centered Korean collectors in late Chosun, where we know that these Chungin connoisseurs and collectors, you know, really kind of revered uh, Kim Jong-hee, and it was done sort of amongst them and for them, uh, sort of thing. Well, um, in terms of option one, uh, we have to wonder, was, was Kim Jong-hee pretty much kind of forgotten after his death in 1856 uh, uh, and even sort of well into the 1910s and 20s? I mean, to what extent was Kim Jong-hee kind of a known thing, uh, um, you know, coming into the colonial period? Um, also, it's, it's actually quite difficult to find any published evidence of widespread um, academic interest in Kim Jong-hee before the late 1920s and, and uh, the 1930s. Um, the, all you, uh, the earliest thing I can find is that you know, Iwakichi has, this art, has two articles in 1911, which I have yet to get my hands on, um, but I, I'm, I'll bet good money he doesn't say anything about uh, Xi Ji. Um, Chang ji Yun in his um, famous you know, book of 1922 about Chosun uh, Confucianism makes no mention whatsoever of Kim Jong-hee. Um, where you do find this kind of sudden um, rise to consciousness of Kim Jong-hee is when this Fujitsuka Chikashi uh, becomes professor at Keijo Imperial University. So 1926, like earlier, you know, right, almost from the get-go, he becomes a professor uh, at Keijo Imperial. He was there for 14 years. And he's teaching Chinese philosophy, but he's really studying, um, uh, you know, kind of broad intellectual trends uh, spanning uh, Qing, Chosun, and um, and uh, Edo. So he kind of rediscovers uh, Kim Jong Hee, and so if you look at this series of publications, uh, sort of bracketed up top by his 1929 article about uh, Ijo scholars and Chenlong uh, culture, and down at the bottom, 1936, his actual uh, doctoral uh, thesis, which is specifically about uh, Chusa Kim Jong-hee. In between there, so 1929 to 1936, while Chen Nam-san writes something about, uh, about um, uh, Kim Jong-hee as a calligrapher, uh, there's an exhibition in 1932 uh, where you have both Japanese collectors and, and um, Korean uh, collectors participating. Um, there was a movement, uh, a couple exhibitions. Um, 1932, there's this article uh, by Obong Bin. Uh, now everybody in the world respects Wandan. So by now, Kim Jong hee is kind of a thing in the early 1930s. 1933, there's this um, sort of fundraiser to create uh, covered steely for both. Uh, uh, Kim Jong-hee and Song Xiyal, 
1934, they finally publish his, uh, um, a Chunjip, a, a collected works by him, which has none other than Chung In Bo writing a preface. And Chung In Bo was the teacher of uh, Iga Wan, right? So this is kind of, uh, I guess, ground zero of the sort of reawakening or, uh, of interest in Kim Jong Hee. Um, and uh, with, with respect to this professor Fujitsuka, who's attracted a lot of attention in recent years, uh, he um, highly uh, rated uh, uh, Kim Jong Hee uh, for a number of reasons. You know, he says a multi-talented uh, sort of genius. But two things: he says he was thoroughly acquainted with his contemporaries in Qing, and he was also deeply engaged with um, Japanese scholarship of, of the same period. And he also moots this kind of cosmopolitan idea uh, of an East Asian Republic of Letters. And you kind of wonder how much this is tied to incipient notions of East Asian post prosperity spheres. Um, uh, I, I haven't looked into that. I think it's mooted maybe by Iho Jin. I'm not sure. So um, Iho Jin, whose work is very interesting, says that although it wasn't really intended, Fujitsuka's research created a kind of Chusa studies boom in Japan on the one hand. Um, um, and whereas um, he was originally kind of known uh, primarily for his calligraphy and his painting and so on. Um, it was really thanks to Fujitsuka that he was reassessed as, oh, he's, you know, a great Confucian thinker and had, you know, as, as a real kind of um, leading intellectual of his age. But furthermore, I think most crucially for, for my purposes here is that he also is said to have single-handedly driven up prices on the antiquities market for anything that was related to Chusa. So anything, any piece of, even today, uh, you know, pieces of calligraphy by uh, Kim Jong-hee fetch a fortune uh, um, at auction uh, in Korea. Um, and so this is kind of uh, thanks to Fujitsuka in the beginning as what Iho Jin would claim. Well, Option two is a little different, um, which is that this idea of Chungin networks. And so here we're, we're very indebted to Sung Ling Kim at Dartmouth, who has um, in a couple articles and in her uh, really beautiful book from a couple years ago, written about Kim Jong Hee and how, and, and you know, says that even during his lifetime, that his calligraphy was, um, was highly sought after. So it was, you know, it was a, it was a commodity um, already during his lifetime. And then Kim Young Gyu, who's at I think Sun Gyung Guan and studies Chungin and Yohang literature, he says um, if we can say that Sadebu literature was constrained as ever toward orthodoxy or Chung, we can also say that Yohang literature, the literature of these Chungin, evinced a tendency to pursue the marvelous. And this kita here, this uh, this uh, ki ha kita, is really a keyword when discussing the, the Xishangji. Uh, everybody who writes about it, including starting with Jin Shengtan, describes the language in it, the literary style, as something quite marvelous. And this was something that everybody aspired to and tried to copy sometimes in, you know, in their writing. And so you know, that would tie in with a kind of Chungin connection. Uh, but the question is, did that really survive into the colonial period? Well. So to kind of wrap up, I think we have to, you know, go for an option three, which is that these two options are not mutually exclusive. Um, so what I think is going on is that enterprising copyists of the Xishangji who are creating manuscripts uh, in order to essentially raise the price uh, of the manuscript that they were producing, um, attached Kim Jong-hee's name and his prestige to the versions that they copied. And so obviously the copy that Iga Wan had and that has now disappeared uh, was one such case. And then this most recent one, the An Sung Jun Bon that claims to be the Wandang um, uh, version, uh, same thing. It was really just cynical use of Kim Jong Hee's name. Um, and then in terms of the timing, so Yun Jiang, um, and I think others have also claimed that this, uh, this boom in, in reading the Xishangji peaked at the turn of the last century. So by the 1890s, you know, first decade of, of the 20th century, it had peaked and it was sort of fading away. But I think that's not at all true. Uh, you know, all indications are that uh, sort of intellectuals and collectors and sort of um, um, anybody with, I guess, a bit of nostalgia. And don't also remember the 1930s is the is the advent of the so-called Chosan Hak boom, this idea of what, what is, you know, 
Chosun like. Um, and this ties into all of that. I think we have to assume that uh, these, these manuscripts were being produced and bought and, and sold and circulated uh, well into the 1930s, um, rather than that this is something that had peaked by the end of the, of, of the 19th century. And I think in, more generally, this is also true in terms of uh, the persistence of traditional reading practices um, and manuscript culture, again, well into the 1930s. I think everybody has been seduced by, you know, sort of tales of, you know, Kim Dong-in and the new literature and, you know, book reading. And we have, uh, what's his name, uh, Chan Dun Huang's, you know, book about uh, reading in, in the colonial period, which, um, it really focuses on print uh, and, and on modern books and doesn't say so much about manuscripts, which I think, so this is essentially another example of what um, my student Scott Wells in his recent dissertation calls the, the, the Hanmun hangover in, um, in colonial Korea that, you know, the, these traditional uh, practices, you know, went on for decades um, and that we shouldn't just sort of assume that everything is, is, is back in Chosan. So um, that's where I will conclude. Um, and let me uh, stop sharing. Um, and uh, I'm almost at about 50 minutes, right? So, okay. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect timing, Ross. Wow, thank you so much. That was so interesting. So it was so interesting to learn about how, um, Kim, you know, sort of reconstruction of Kim Jong-hee <laughs> through yeah. the, you know, 20th century scholars. Um, and um, despite the fact that it's really unclear whether he's actually, you know, uh, produced those uh, manuscripts. Um, so we have, uh, so I would like to ask our audience uh, to, you know, to feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box if you have. Um, uh, I think, you know, uh, as people start to submit their questions, I'll get to them later, but I think I would like to start with, um, Jisoo, before you do that, I want to take a, um, a three minute bio break and then I'll be ready for your question and all the other ones. Can I just oh, take sure, a quick Sure, break? sure, sure. Yeah, no problem. Then break. this will give time for our audience to pre prepare questions. Yes. So, um, yeah. Uh, so to our audience, please feel free to submit your questions. I'll definitely make sure to try to address all the questions. I am ready. Good. Good. Okay. Um, all right, so um, yeah, I'd like to start by um, asking, well, since we have uh, students here, um, just to give more little, you know, background uh, information about, first of all, what this, you know, Sisyanji, uh, what this, uh, you know, play is about, and also, like, you know, in Chosan, um, why was it, uh, why did it appeal, uh, among other uh, books, why did it appeal to our Cho Chosan um, audience? And I think also, uh, well, that's just basic background question, sure. you know, question for our uh, students, just in case they are not familiar with, you know, what, uh, what, uh, you know, Sixianji uh, and also, um, you know, sort of uh, audience um, or the readers or, or the you know, right the audience uh, of this um, of this is about in, in the Chosan. And also, and so my second question is about, um, uh, you know, how these. Chosan, uh, like, you know, some of the, uh, like either it be plays or novels, uh, you know, or, or these you know, vernacular novels, whatever is from, uh, from the Chosan period. So I'm kind of more interested in the continuation uh, during the colonial period. So is this, do you, do you see this as being uh, during the colonial period, something very common to continue to produce these kind of chosen manuscripts, reproduce these kind of chosen manuscripts, or is it just you know few? I mean, I I guess I'm <laughs> revealing my ignorance of the colonial <laughs> period here, but uh, I mean, sure. what is? Yeah, if you could talk a little bit about that. Okay, so um, first about kind of a little bit of background about the play, and then more generally about survival of or kind of reproduction of manuscripts of other works of literature into the colonial period, yeah? yeah. So, okay, so the play, uh, so it's called the Shishangji or Sasangi in Korean. Uh, it's, um, there's a wonderful Eng English translation by um, 
Stephen West and Will Tadema called The Story of the Western Wing. Mm -hmm. And it is um, a love story. It's what it's in the genre of the kind of scholar and beauty romance, where uh, the scholar, you know, falls in love with beautiful young woman, and then overcomes various hardships, and they, you know, they get married and live happily ever after. Um, but it's a scandalous story in the eyes of um, uh, Chosan Literati because they meet uh, at a Buddhist temple where she is with her mother getting ready to perform funerary rites for her recently deceased father. He catches sight of her and there ensues a very torrid uh, love affair between them where, um, uh, you know, which includes a, a, a fairly, um, I wouldn't say explicit, but nonetheless uh, obvious uh, a scene of, of, um, of lovemaking where they're not yet betrothed and married. Um, and so this was, you know, beyond the pale uh, in terms of, of Chosun Confucian sort of uh, mores. Um, so it was considered an umso, a book that was kind of lewd. Um, so, and yet it was, it, it was hugely popular, um, largely because of its uh, style. It was written, it was not written in sort of standard classical Hanmun. It, it's written in vernacular Sinitic, but what, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a vernacular register of Hanmun, which was quite um, alien to most uh, Confucian literati. And they found, on the one hand, they found that language quite uh, interesting and titillating and new and newfangled, um, but they also uh, were uh, quite enamored with Jin Shengtan's commentary on the text, uh, which everybody read um, and sort of feeds into this um, period in the 18th century, um, uh, especially under Cheng, Chengzhou, when pe uh, there was this experiment, experimentation with other kinds of non-classical, uh, so we say, uh, literary registers. And then, you know, Chengzhou carries out this uh, well-known kind of literary um, Sort of inquisition, the 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 the, the Munche Panjong, and so on. So this Xi Shangji was kind of at the center of that as as a kind of classic example of the kind of text that self-respecting Confucian scholars really shouldn't be wasting their time on. It infects their writing style, it infects their brains, it infects their moral, um, and yet you know very popular. So that's maybe a, a, a short thing about the play itself. And, and one could argue this is one of, certainly the, the most popular of all uh, Chinese plays. Uh, drama itself was not uh, a really um, popular uh, genre in Chosun. Uh, uh, Chosun literati did not write uh, plays like Chinese literati did in, you know, in Qing or Ming and Qing. Um, it, there's literally, I think, two or three known plays written by uh, Chosun literati that you know, never circulated, they're only, uh, only in manuscript and so on. And they're all basically riffing off of the Xi Shangji. That's how sort of, I guess, influential it was. And then to your second question, Ji Su, does this happen with other, do, I mean, do we know that other texts were copied? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, there, in fact, there we have tons of, of you know, Koja and Sosa manuscripts that actually do have dates on them where they're clearly copied in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and so, you know, the, the Cho Hi Ung uh, massive series, his thing, you know, documenting all the different um, uh, editions and variant editions of, of various uh, traditional narratives uh, lists all of these. Um, and so, it, it, you know, it's definitely um, the case that these things continued to have a, a life well into the into the colonial period, and in fact, even after liberation. So, uh, at which point many of them are simply just being uh, rather than copied out by hand, even being printed, you know, and the so-called Kuhachabun. And you have those even into the 1950s. There was a readership for them, otherwise the people wouldn't have bothered to print them. Um, so yeah, again, the, these traditional uh, kind of reading tastes and so on uh, survived well past, uh, you know, Chosan. Yeah, I mean, I guess I was, you know, uh, more curious about how common, you know, these practices are, right? I mean, I'm sure there are other... Um, yeah, I don't know how you would measure that, though. I mean, um, you know, all you can really do is is uh, see what's left in terms, you know, and the, many of these kinds of uh, manuscripts did not, you know, survive well. So uh, how would you measure, um, uh, except maybe through, I guess comments by by observers at the time. Uh, and so how how common? I don't know. Uh, I think it's, uh, all, all I would say is probably a lot more common that we have been given to believe by the narrative of, you know, the rise of modern literature. 
Yes. Uh, Which was yeah. really a tiny group of people and, you know, things circulating and printed in tiny numbers, the stuff that Kim Dong-in and, and people like that were, were writing. Yeah. I mean, lack of sources, that's always a, <laughs> you know, uh, a you know, unfortunate thing, uh, especially in our field. Uh, you know, I mean, we've lost so many sources. Um, and that's always, uh, you know, a problem. I mean, we want to learn more, but there's just, you know, not enough sources that's showing us. Um, okay, uh, great. Uh, thanks. Um, so let me start addressing first question uh, from Rob uh, Provine. Uh, he's asking, why would arias be conservative material? Is it like uh, toponyms retaining old pronunciations? The idea of translating only arias from the play is curious to me. Uh, it's not that they were conservative. Um, it's that uh, I think the, the, the Chosun literati were were kind of fascinated by the by the language in them, and also just by because they they're poems. They're essentially a, a form of poetry, and um, that was what I think attracted them first. So the, 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 they're a very different kind of uh, genre tucked into the text, where you have you know sometimes you have uh, sort of just straight up narration, sometimes you have dialogue, and then you have these songs. And so that the, they gravitated in the first instance when they started kind of. Uh, shall we say, uh, domesticating the text, uh, they, the, the first thing they looked at or they went to was, was the arias uh, because they were also more challenging, I think, just in terms of the language. And I don't know if they were conservative. Uh, if anything, they were probably uh, quite radically newfangled because it was it was bai hua, which is something they weren't used to. It's very, very different from the, you know, heptasyllabic regulated verse that they were all kind of trained in. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, thank you. Next question from um, Yang Wu. So um, he wrote a long com uh, co uh, comment and question. So thank you so much for this marvelous talk. I think it is insightful of you to ask when Kim Jong-hee became frequently mentioned in Korean culture. It certainly fits the timeline when Kim's name carries currency enough to appear, for example, as an annotator translator of Xi Xianji, your talk reminds one of example uh, where the philosopher's name Li Zhou Wu uh, Itago was borrowed mm -hmm. in late Ming China on the title pages of many popular literature titles, though he had nothing to do with those titles. Using the name of someone famous and the privilege um, uh, privileged, uh, is in intuitively understandable, but I was curious how the Xi Xiangji fits the image of Kim Jong-hee, that is how Kim was perceived among the colonial Korean intellectuals especially when these copies were not so com commercially as manuscripts, unlike those Ming Chinese copies that obviously tried to take advantage of it for sales. Well, first of all, the, the, the um, mention of Itago uh, as a parallel case is, is, is spot on. And in fact, there are also um, printed editions of the Shishangji from China that that also claimed to be by Itago with it and have his commentary and some of those survive in Korea and some of the commentary from them get copied over into Korean manuscripts so that, that that's a really helpful um, uh, point um, the remind me of the second bit again so um uh, so using the name of oh the, the image what was it about the image of, of yeah. Kim Jong Hee in the colonial period well that that's kind of a, the six million dollar question because there's actually to my to my knowledge really nothing uh, about uh, Kim Jong Hee that would make sense to tie him to the Xi Shangji unless it's coming out of this kind of Chungin kind of um, environment where it's all about. Um, you know, almost a kind of um, dilettantism or dandyism and um, this, you know, this connection to ki ha ki cha, um, you know, both in terms of lifestyle, in terms of your painting, in terms of your calligraphy, and in terms of the kind of books you read, because this, that's the keyword, uh, a keyword for, for the Xi Shangji. But um, actually finding something from the colonial period that makes that connection uh, I, ha I haven't found anything yet. Um, as I say, I'm still um, trying to uh, chase down some of these uh, references that I showed you from the colonial period. Um, but that, that's another reason, I think, why it's kind of a stretch to, to even for, for someone like Yiga One, who in some ways ought to know better, to just take that at face value and say, oh, this was done by, by Kim Jong-hee, rather than ask, you know, why would someone want to do that? And I really do think it's just more of a kind of, well, if I do this, it's going gonna, it's gonna to raise, you know, it's going to put another zero uh, on, on the asking price. And um, as to, I mean, I think I recall uh, Young mentioning that these things weren't really um, commercially 
traded uh, in the colonial period, but it, I think in fact they good. were. Um, mm -hmm. And the other place to start looking for this, you know, there was an actual um, club, a kind of society of bibliophiles that published a journal. It's a little bit later than, um, it starts I think late 30s into the 1940s. Um, uh, but uh, that would be the other place that this, it's the, something, I, to, uh, I can't remember the title and have it off the top of my head, but um, you know, there, there were collectors um, and, and there was a thriving, you know, the Japanese, I mean, if it, it's a different topic, but when you go back and look at James Scarth Gale's book buying activities in the first two decades of the 20th century, because he was actually tasked by Chosen Christian College, you know, now Yonsei University, to chair a committee to acquire old books, you know, for the uh, Chosen Christian College. And in his notes, um, and in some of the other things he left, he basically says the Japanese collectors have already stripped the market. This is in the 19th. Teens. The Japanese have already stripped the market of all the old books, and, and it's really hard to find old books now. So I mean, you know, maybe maybe the market was maybe the target market was Japanese, not Korean collectors. I don't know. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we I think Bodowitz uh Bodowitz and has raised his hand. Hi Bodowine. Thank you very much, Ross, for the very interesting talk. Actually, I made it a remark because I, I hadn't understood that question QA was the place to put the questions. No, so this is think... totally fine. I think you know we should use this from now on instead of putting, you know, asking our audience to just write. It. I mean, this is way much easier. And just yeah, because I didn't know you know we had this function. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, you know, the rest of our audience, if you would rather just you know talk, uh, asking questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Function. <laughs> uh, I have no question actually, but maybe I would like to make one remark about the question was just discussed. Uh, um, recently, I have done my, myself a talk about book culture in the 19th century and um, wanted to express that uh, the manuscript actually in 19th century Korea could be something very valuable, not, not just an, a preliminary uh, stage of the book or a more primitive stage of the book, because in a way, the um, some of the novels that were produced for the royal court yeah. on silk and very beautiful calligraphy, they were like the haute couture of uh, Korean book uh, uh, production. Huh? And the books like Hong Kil Tong John were just books uh, where uh, cheap paperbacks uh, by comparison. And I think I got the impression of the early 20th century manuscripts uh, with illustrations even, huh? which, which is a lot of extra trouble and uh, also good calligraphy and so on. That's a kind of haute couture or uh, kind of so something ex extra valuable, which certainly would have commercial value as well. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a, a good point. And it, it just reminds me, um, and you've also written about uh, other, you, I think you have another paper on, you know, reader culture as well. The, um, the, um, Unfortunate thing is that uh, Korean scholarship has been so focused on print and on movable type and, you know, sort of uh, the achievements in Korean, the history of Korean culture uh, with, with, with print culture that I think manuscripts and manuscript culture, ha it's all been somewhat unfairly um, neglected up until now. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, uh, any other questions from our audience? I uh, will ask, I guess in the meantime, I'll ask uh, my own, another question. <laughs> um, so, Russ, do you think that uh, this kind of new, you know, um, introductions or theories about uh, Kim Jong-un uh, in, you know, um, uh, Kim Jong-un's um, work on this, you know, uh, like Iga one's work, or so is there? Do you think it's still um, there's still hardline defenders of like Iga one's work and you know kind of? Oh, so thank you. Actually, I didn't make this point when I finished. So uh, what I think is going on is so you know again this was goes back to this question of literary fame, right? And so in the case of Kim Jong Hee, his literary fame is being cynically 
mot uh, mobilized, I think, to add value to um, you know manuscripts that really have nothing to do with him. But in the case of Iga Wan, his particular theory, despite its its patent kind of uh, lack of evidence, is being kind of touted and reproduced as 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 another exercise in creating a kind of mythological persona for Iga Wan and his academic lineage. And so, you know, there's two two different sort of uh, I guess, vectors of literary fame that are going on here. One is Kim Jong-hee and the other is Iga Wan. And at this point, it's looking like um, the Iga Wan line has become almost the kind of the Chengsa, uh, um, you know, because the people who are, who are making these claims in those recent papers, none of them cite any of that other research, which is actually much more, you know, recent and more in-depth about you know, what the actual other manuscripts say. So it's part of the South Korean, I think, you know, hakpo kind of culture that's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, that, that's a shame. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, it's everywhere in South Korea, right? It's everything is so inbred and it's all about what what line you're in. And, and to this day, even uh, people in Hanmunhak in Korea, they all know who who's, whose ancestors belong to which, you know, which faction is <laughs> Joseon, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, um, this uh, topic about uh, print culture in, uh, in, in Chosan and, uh, and I guess also, you know, beyond uh, Chosan, like into the early 20th century, I think, you know, I mean, there are a lot of, I think, works that's, that's come out related to, you know, um, re related to the topic uh, recently, but we definitely see but in the actually, the, uh, if you look at the print culture itself, relatively speaking, compared to China or Japan, there's really, you know, uh, uh, we see so, so, uh, I mean, relatively, I mean, it's not so influential or, or, or well, not influential, but, you know, it, we, it, it's not as, the, the market itself is obviously not as big as, because, I mean, there, you know, I mean, it was government controlled and it was, you know, I mean, I mean, that private market, there's this question of, you know, this private market, um, but how would you, could you like, you know, uh, talk a little um, about the, just, you know, for our students and the audience, uh, I'm actually more thinking about our students in the audience, but, you know, like about uh, this print culture or about, you know, this um, literary uh, field of, uh, of late Chosun period and perhaps, you know, what was going on related to print culture uh, into the early uh, 20th century. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a, a huge topic, <clears throat> a big question, and then there are others uh, sitting in the room that know more about print culture in Chosun than I do. I, I think the, the key point is that, as you alluded uh, to in your uh, question, that the, the Chosun state uh, guarded um, printing very jealously. And, and you know, there, there were no bookshops until very late in Chosun. Um, and you couldn't just go out and print things. It was, it was generally either, uh, there's very little private printing, right? So a huge contrast, let's say, um, contemporary uh, Japan. And so if you wanted to print something, you were either, you know, in a government controlled printing office or perhaps uh, in, a, in a temple. Uh, um, and um, so, th but, but, which again highlights the importance of manuscript and manuscript culture because everything was all the, you know, was being copied and then you had to copy and that's how things circulated. Um, so, you know, in terms of the market, uh, there, there still isn't a lot of good research on, on um, how, uh, I guess manuscripts were bought and sold or, or circulated. Um, uh, we do know something about um, there is some recently some recent good research on bibliophiles on book collecting and on libraries, private libraries. Um, you know, including Kang Myung Guan, uh, but there are others. Um, so um, yeah, it's it is different from China and, and different again from from Japan. Um, but for my mind, it, it just means you have to go look at the manuscripts. And, and the, the stunning thing to me about Korea and the way scholarship gets done in Korea is that you have all, you know, all these books and these manuscripts sitting in publicly available library in the sense that they're university libraries or they're the national library. But actually, very few scholars actually take the time to just take a bus across Seoul to go look at them. Um, you know, or maybe, I don't know, maybe I am just lucky because they figure, oh, well, we'll show it to this, this Weigugin because what the hell would he know? And, and you know, because 
colleagues do complain, Korean colleagues do complain about difficulty getting access to some of these manuscripts uh, in certain libraries in Korea are more notorious than others in terms of the difficulty of access. So Yonsei University is notorious for making it very difficult to look at uh, or let alone, you know, take a few photos of, of their manuscripts and of their old books. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, it's, it's just sort of stunning to me that so few Korean scholars do the legwork and actually just go around and look at texts. Um, and, and so the number of people that are doing that is smaller than it really needs to be. Um, and that's the, the only way we can really answer those questions. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, thank you. Uh, I think we have a question from Yang. So thank you for your answer. If I could, um, I have another small question. You mentioned one's of Andong University collection of Shishanji manuscripts. Do we know where those copies were from, which family or whose collection? I find it interesting that books like that was in collection of Yangnam intellectuals, if that is what it means. Well, I mean, that's a great question. And here again, another sort of real shame about a lot of these collections is that very rarely do any of these, um, especially university libraries, very rarely do they have any information about provenance for these things. So for the Andong de Hakyo uh, copy, I'm um, seeing if I can uh, pull up the uh, slide again. Um, I'm not aware of, you know, I mean, basically in most cases, the only information you have is what's in the manuscript itself. Um, and so I can, let me just share this again real quick. Um, because there's something uh, on this one. Uh, can you now, can everybody see my screen now? Jisoo, can you see yeah, this? Yeah. yeah. Let me just pull this up. But so the, the next page, um, you can see here, somebody went in and wrote on this, but it's obviously a, a much later thing. You know, Sogi 1830 or something, maybe, you know, like someone tried to put a date to this, um, but, you know, it's not clear what the evidence uh, for that is in this particular copy. and. Um, I'm not aware of any other information about this text. Let me, what, what does this, oh, oh, sorry, I was trying to click on that bubble, but I can't do that in the, uh, in the PowerPoint. Um, so uh, unfortunately, there, there's just no really good answer um, for that kind of thing in most cases, Young, uh, because these things trickle in and people didn't, you know, when, when they came into these libraries, you know, the librarian in charge, frequently these librarians are not experts in, in in you know um codicology they don't know what they're looking at and you know it just sits there and years pass and then oh yeah okay um so don't know um and oftentimes we just don't know and you have to go sometimes you're, if you're lucky there'll be uh something about the owner of the book you know the tech jew it'll tell you who that was and if you're lucky you can you can actually find the name. So one of the other reasons I was mentioning that um, I think that some of these manuscripts, at least of, of Shishangji, were circulating well into the 1930s is that um, there's another copy at, um, oh, I think it's, uh, it might be Tangukte, um, but a uh, beautiful manuscript with a bunch of other things in it, but uh, it has a name on it. And the name, uh, you know, it turns out to be a, a well-known um, sort of Korean intellectual from the 1920s and 30s who was active in the world of theater and drama in Korea, but who had studied in Beijing. Um, and so, you know, clearly he he had an interest in the in the Shishangji as a as a an actual kind of drama person. But his dates are such that he must have you know uh, acquired this in, in the uh, um, in the 1920s and 30s. Of course, it doesn't mean the manuscript itself was from the 1920s or 30s, but you know, uh, nonetheless, someone like him was was chasing them down or, or had thought to purchase it in the 1930s. So um, th that's really all we have is what's actually in the manuscript um, uh, themselves. Great. Um, okay, so we have a question from Lauren Duff. Um, she's asking, can you elaborate a little on the lexical glosses used within the manuscripts themselves? I know that the use of glosses within chosen transcription and translation were quite complex and more limited to the upper classes and the government. How were the glosses applied in the context of a different style of synodic writing style as in the case of this work? And do those glosses indicate who was going to be reading it or able to read it? Yeah, great question. Um, so the, I do have um, uh, a, a long uh, chapter, uh, 
currently in press with a volume uh, coming out from Amsterdam University Press um, on um, sort of translation practice in pre-modern East Asia, which uh, specifically uh, discusses what I call the, um, the, the Xixiangji glossarial complex, which looks at glossing across um, uh, many of these different uh, Xixiangji manuscripts. And first of all, the fact that it's glossed at all tells us, uh, I mean, almost all of them are glossed in the sense that they have kugyun, right? So the traditional glossing technique that was really reserved either for canonical works or for pedagogical works. And, you know, not just any text would be worthy of adding kugyo glosses to. And yet the Xixiangji always, uh, almost invariably has uh, kugyo attached as well as lexical glosses uh, in the margin, which tells you that it, it had a kind of uh, pseudo canonical status, but that it was also being used pedagogically to access this really wacko um, register of um, Bai Hua, uh, it wasn't called Bai Hua then, but of vernacular Semitic. Um, and the actual lexical glosses themselves um, are really interesting in the sense that, uh, like I say, sometimes they're in Hanmun, sometimes they're in vernacular, um, but it tends to be uh, words that um, are, it tends to be words or particles in Hanmun that are not behaving in the sort of canonically classical way that are sort of, you know, have a different function from what they, you typically learn if you're learning sort of the, the four books, if you will. Um, uh, or just really difficult words that are, you know, again, sort of vernacular words that uh, they just don't know uh, and that they need a gloss for, and inclu including things like, um, there's in the very beginning lines of the Xixiangji, one of the words that gets glossed is, you know, if you know modern Mandarin, the word for clean is ganjing. Uh, and, and so that he, he checks into this inn, uh, or the protagonist uh, checks into this inn and looks around and says, oh, this, you know, it's, it's, it, it looks like a very clean place. Um, and this word ganjing gets glossed uh, because that, that's not, it's not a use, it's not a word that, that any uh, Chosun literatus would know. And the thing is it gets glossed differently across different manuscripts because they actually weren't 100% sure what it meant. Um, and because you know, it's not like they could look it up online and they didn't have dictionaries of, of, of uh, so um, the other connection then is that, well, who, who, was, who was actually glossing and providing these glosses? And, and the theory is, but again, there's no smoking gun. The theory is that it was probably these um, these interpreter officials, these yukwan, that were producing uh, a lot of the, the glosses, or you know, or people that otherwise had exposure to um, other registers uh, of of spoken uh, Sinitic or or you know or Bai Hua type literature. Okay, um, great question, Lauren. I mean, Lauren was my student last semester in my history of Korea class. And she's also currently our um, undergraduate research fellows at our institute at GWA. Well, anyway, I, I, I take a look at this. This It's in press now. should be out within the next month or two from Amsterdam University Press as an edited volume. Uh, Peter Kornitsky, uh, Patricia Zieber at Ohio State, and uh, Guo Yu um, in Utah are the three editors. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, next question uh, from Jonathan Best. You mentioned that in the early 20th century, the market availability of old books in Korea was greatly diminished due to the purchases of Japanese collectors and dealers. Has the presence of chosen manuscripts in Japanese collections been investigated to the extent possible? I fully recognize the limitations of locating such antiquities in Japanese private collections due to my own efforts to locate early Korean art, especially Buddhist art there. Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, we do have the uh, the Herculean kind of efforts of Fujimoto Yukio, who has systematically over, you know, five or six decades been um, tracking down and describing, you know, writing up all of these old uh, Korean editions held in Japanese collections, although not private collections, just sort of public collections. Um, you know, and it, it, it's, you know, the first two volumes are each, you know, massive tomes. Um, but uh, there again, um, tr print trumps uh, manuscript. And so most of what he's describing um, is all uh, print, you know, either, either, you know, movable type or, or woodblock print, not a lot of manuscripts in there, although he does describe, uh, um, he writes up a couple works that are related to the Xixiangji, but, uh, you know, I think there probably is more. Um, and, you know, we just don't have, nobody's tried to, it'd be impossible to do. Uh, it, it is frustrating. I, I've also, I, I made a point of spending one, uh, a, a sabbatical 
uh, 10 years ago uh, at Waseda University and went around looking at collections and trying to look at, at old books, so which you can do, but you know, this, the, the, the sort of $6 million question is what's in private hands, what's out there that we don't know about, um, and no one really seems to be on that trail. And of course, also what's in temples, because uh, a lot of, lot of books, especially after Hideyoshi's sort of um, predations ended up um, in temples. Um, but yeah, it's virtually impossible for anybody outside of Japan to really do. It's very frustrating. Okay, um, great. Uh, I guess I would like to end with uh, my final question related to, um, or, or if I mean, if our audience has any other questions, uh, please let me know, I'd be happy to address. Um, but so this, uh, you know, this work, what you presented today, I mean, I know you have, you know, several research projects going on, but, uh, and you just mentioned that, you know, your uh, book chapter is also on, uh, on this, you know, glosses out, coming out. Um, so, so is this, so how does this fit into your, like, is this going to be published as a, you know, broader, your, you know, um, book project, or, or is it, how does this fit into your, um, yeah, uh, research agenda? Right. Well, I'm, I'm actually not 100% sure what I'm going to do with this particular uh, sort of paper, or, uh, but um, a lot of this research was carried out when I still had funding from one of these uh, Academy of Korean Studies uh, labs, right? When, 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 so when the funding was flowing, um, did a lot of research on this that's still sort of sitting in a drawer. Um, I'm more interested in the glosses and in the actual in comparing the different uh, vernacular translations across manuscripts and have a big database of all of that. Um, uh, you know, we have a database of several thousand glosses. Um, but none of, you know, there's just no way that'll get, um, and then I, I, we did have a conference a few years ago at UBC where we brought together Kim Hyo Min and, and Yoon Ji Young and some of these uh, people who've really studied the, uh, these different manuscripts. Um, and we sort of have in, in draft form uh, a, a, a volume that would be several different papers, some of them uh, English translations of some of that research that's already been published in Korea. Um, you know, uh, plus whatever else I decide to put in there. But I, you know, don't hold your breath. I've got several other things that have to happen before I really get to that. But it, it's just kind of overwhelming. There's so much um, out there for the, for this particular text. Yeah, um, I mean, I think this is, uh, you know, very interesting topic. And also, because it also, you know, um, relates to how, uh, you know, foreign, foreign place texts were imported and how it was circulated. And it's not just within Korea, right? I mean, it's, it's, we're talking about in East Asian context. So these kind of, you know, circulation of uh, texts and along with knowledge. So I think this is very interesting topic and uh, I very much look forward to, um, uh, you know, I mean, First of all, your forthcoming, uh, many forthcoming <laughs> books plus this edited, uh, you know, I mean, and book chapter related to glosses and uh, and also um, this uh, presentation that you gave today. Thank you. Well, thank so, you for uh, the opportunity, uh, Jisoo, to speak, and thank you all for 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 listening and for sticking through to the bitter end here. Yeah, uh, thanks to our audience. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We have uh, another pre-modern Korea lecture series talk coming up in February uh, by Professor Mar Marjorie Burge, who is at the University of Colorado Boulder. She's going to be talking about Shila Mokan, which is also another very fascinating research. So please join us uh, again in February. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks to us again. And yeah. thanks to our uh, GBIC staff, who's uh, done a great job um organizing this event thank you all hi everybody <laughs>